Let's ball in the Central Committee. Let's cringe in the Central Committee. Let's bog in the Central Committee right now. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, that's gonna be a bad, bad couple years for that guy. <laughs> Violence is bad, by the way. I'm very depressed that we are in the age of excuses. I spent eight years listening to Obama's excuses. Now we have to spend four listening to excuses for Biden. Don't tell me why you can't do it. Tell me how you're gonna do it anyway. People who spent their time explaining why things can't be done never get anything done. People who are set seemingly impossible goals and then go from there are responsible for all change. A social habit should exist that anyone who makes an excuse for Biden should be hissed at. We made an excuse, not his, made a mistake, not hissing at all the people justifying Obama's inaction last time. I feel incredibly bad that my brain is filled with all the excuses and context for every failure of the Obama presidency that I carried around like some righteous tome in my head, prepared to deliver if I ever needed to warm some conservative with facts. It just sucked. And I think this is... This is actually what needs to start happening. Is I'm tired of this too. I think, are you guys tired of this too? Every fucking liberal goes out of their way to explain why all the people they spent so much time supporting actually can't do anything important and suck shit. As opposed to, I'll give you an example. Student loan debt. Right now, Joe Biden could get rid of all student loan debt with the flick of a pen. He doesn't need Joe Manchin. He doesn't need Mitch McConnell. He doesn't need to overturn the filibuster. Joe Biden could do that. But he won't. You can't spend $2 trillion in infrastructure? How about, how about the second best thing? Spend $1.6 trillion. And by the way, it's not even spending it. Why don't you inject $1.6 trillion into our economy by forgiving all student loan debt? Republicans want to negotiate? Sure, fine. Negotiate all you want. Every single dollar you cut from your infrastructure bill, put that into a student loan forgiveness. Suddenly, I think the Republicans might consider spending a little bit more on infrastructure. But see, he doesn't care about you. And we're going to make excuses. We're just going to forget that he can do that. We're going to let that fall to the wayside. Joe Biden can forgive all your student loan debt right now without a single move from Joe Manchin or Congress. But he's not going to. Joe Manchin could federally decriminalize and legalize marijuana without going through Congress. It's the DEA that sets the, the, the uh, in the Controlled Substances Act, it is the DEA who sets the policy about what drugs are on Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3, Schedule 4, Schedule 5. And it is Joe Biden who appoints the EPA administrator. Joe Biden could direct his EPA administrator to legalize marijuana right fucking now. He doesn't need an act of Congress, but he won't. You're telling me those two things, forgiving all student debt and ending our war on drugs, and especially in marijuana, would not be popular? He doesn't need Joe Manchin for that, but he's not going to do it. I wonder why. Well, we just have to accept that Joe Biden doesn't want to do that. We just have to accept it. If nothing could pass through Congress, then I want Joe Biden to do the stuff that he can do without Congress. But see, he won't. Where's the excuse makers now? What's the justification? Well, you know, see, forgiving student loan debt wouldn't be the most optimal way of reducing income inequality and wealth inequality. Therefore, we shouldn't do it. Well, we can't do any of the optimal ways because of the filibuster. Well, see, that's just you being an immature lefty. Wait a minute. We can't do the best stuff because you guys love the filibuster so fucking much. So we can't do the second best things because they're not the best things. So we're going to do nothing. And now you understand the game. Now you understand the game.
I'm gonna show you an example of someone who makes excuses all fucking day for Dems. I I know people like Hutch are good meaning people. They they're they're nice guys. But let me tell you this. I was there in 2010, in 2012, in 2014. I was a Hutch. To my shame, I made a lot of excuses for the Dems. Now, I was never this bad, actually. It's fine. I got I'm a mad person, so I was never this bad. I was like, wait a minute. They're not going to do anything? I was like, what? They have 60 senators! They're not going to do anything? They have 60 fucking senators! No immigration reform. No voting bill. No card check. All the stuff Obama campaigned on, he had 60 fucking senators! He didn't do any of it! If tomorrow, Joe Biden had 60 senators, 60 Dems, wouldn't matter. None of this shit would pass. You'd have four or five Dems, who would vote with the Republicans to uphold the filibuster, it wouldn't happen. Now we need 65 Dems, 66 Dems, 67 Dems, before we can ever complain. Do you see the fucking game? Well, we have 67 senators because they, they won in red states. You don't expect them to vote against their own voters. Wait a minute. How about we ask those voters in that state whether they support the policy? Why do we why do we stop assuming Republican equal they be against our policy? How about we go and talk to the people about the policy or poll the people about the policy and see how popular it is? Oh, because if we did that, we couldn't hide behind the excuse that it's a red state. Because people support the $50 minimum wage. People support the For the People Act. We couldn't do that. So all this shit. Elect one or two more Dem senators in 22, plus hold the House, and Manchin loses like 90% of his power. False. They elect one or two more senators, and son suddenly Dianne Feinstein doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. Chris Coons doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. Tim Kaine doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. Suddenly, all sorts of people are going to spring out who don't want to get rid of the filibuster. We would have to elect 18 more Democratic senators, and even then, fuck, I don't think they'd get rid of it. Elect one or two more Dem senators at 22, plus hold the House. Okay, this is plausible because it's such a bad map for Republicans. Let's take a look at, I want to evaluate what Hutch is saying, and then we'll go, we'll go forward from there. Senate elections in 2022. Let's go over to that. Oh, fuck me. So what we have right here is we have Democratic incumbents in Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia that are up for election. And Colorado. So every single one of those, right, and worst of all, New Hampshire, right? So those are the seats that the Dems could lose. Plausibly, the Dems could lose Nevada, they could lose Georgia, they could lose Colorado, they could lose Arizona, or they could lose Nevada. So that's one, two, three, four, five hard defenses they're going to have to play. They could plausibly lose any of those seats. Right? So they got at least five hard defenses. What are the seats that the Republicans could plausibly lose? Florida? I don't know about that. North Carolina. So both Florida and North Carolina, those are Trump states. Oof, that's that's rough. Okay, so uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin are blue, right? Those are blue states. So those would be top targets. So the Dems have what? Two good targets, maybe? Maybe Ohio, but I don't think so. Maybe Iowa? I don't think so. That was another red state. So the Dems have two states that are actually plausible targets. Maybe three or four if you're being generous. I don't consider Missouri to be a target, chat. But why not? You give it a shot. Who knows, right? You give it a shot. You don't let any... You, you run somebody in every district, right? But I don't think that's plausible. So we face that. So best case scenario, Dems pick up what? Two, three seats? That's not enough to overturn the filibuster, folks. I know Rachel Maddow sucks, but it's a good quick video. Yeah, we're going to watch this. Don't you worry. I'm, I'm building up to it. So best case scenario, Dems. So first of all, in Hutch's fantasy world, 
The Dems get their wildest dreams. They actually win in a midterm and gain seats. Which, goddamn, when's the last time the Dems did that? Why is it when the Republicans obstruct their base loves it, when the Dems do it, a Republican president, people hate it? I don't think they do. Dems are going to lose hard in 22. They've barely done anything so far in power. It don't seem like they plan on doing anything. There is no reason for people to vote Dem. I mean, there is a reason. There, the reason is to stop the Republicans. But that doesn't work when you're in power, right? Like, when you control the government... And you got, you got to vote for me to stop the Republicans. And they're going to be like, but you're not doing anything. The Republicans say they have, they have something. And, what, and the other thing that happens, and this is the other factor, is it's not just people switching from Democrat to vote Republican. It's the fact that the Republican base is angry because they're out of power. Right? So the Republican base is all fired up and angry because they're out of power. So they're coming out to vote. But the Democratic base, they're complacent. They're exhausted. They're disappointed. So they don't show up. So you got all the re Republicans fired up and angry and disappointed Democrats. Plus you add the voter suppression. Plus you add the gerrymandering. Plus you add the terrible fucking candidates. Jim Clyburn months ago said they are running off the COVID bill for midterms. There is no fucking way people are going to remember the COVID bill in 2022. We barely remember it now. He doesn't lose 90% of his power. He doesn't. He doesn't. Don't let a single moderate make you apathetic heading into the midterms because I promise it'll be so much worse if the GOP takes back Congress and that doesn't have to happen. So what he doesn't seem to understand is the gerrymandering that's going to happen. And it definitely sucks that Manchin is the way he is, but ARP was signed into law March 11th. Millions of families set to begin receiving an additional 300 a month per kid this month. Chat. It only lasts for one year. The child allowance only lasts for one year. It's going to expire before the midterms next year. Hutch, they're going to stop paying people in July of 2022. That's going to give everybody a couple months to realize they're no longer getting the money. Wait, why did they cut off my allowance? The Democrats just don't want to abolish the filibuster. And then the Republicans come out and say, I'll get you the child tax credit back. And boom o bam -o, what's supposed to be a Democratic idea, suddenly you add a, a couple billion dollars of ads, and then it's confused. And nobody knows what's going on. They foster an incredible amount of apathy by not following through on promises time and time again. But see, if you say that, Derry, you're a dick. Because... It'll be so much worse if the Republicans control things. Mike, people forgot Trump got impeached twice already. Nobody cares. Gerrymandering makes holding the House pretty much impossible. And it says Dems have their own gerrymandering opportunities in New York, Illinois, and Maryland. More states have independent commissions or, or other reforms now, and more states have gone have de Democrat Dem governors now. It'll be hard, but not impossible. Maryland is already fully gerrymandered, as is Illinois, which lost seats through redistricting. Republicans control far more governing trifectas than both purple and red states gaining seats. It's a pure disaster for Dems. They'll likely lose 20 seats from new maps alone. Uh, if Dems were, and then somebody asked me, they were like, um, somebody asked me like, Mike, the most I've heard is that the, the Dems are going to lose three and a half seats from redistricting. And that is from the reapportionment alone. That is moving states from blue states like Pennsylvania, well, I mean, like, well, Pennsylvania is a purple state, but moving states, moving districts from states like Illinois and New York and moving them to Texas, right? That's going to result in the Republicans gaining seats, lock, stock, and barrel. But there's another aspect, which is the new maps, because the 2010 gerrymander, as good as it was, it didn't take into account a lot of factors that have happened in 2020. 10 years in politics does matter. Things have changed a bit since 2010. An example is a lot more white working class voters, or excuse me, white middle class college educated voters are now voting Democrat. Those are the people that are living in the close in suburbs. You know, the collar counties of Philadelphia, the counties surrounding Atlanta, the counties surrounding Austin, right? A lot of those people used to vote Republican. They voted Republican for Mitt Romney, but they're now voting Democrat. So the old maps are starting not to work in a few cases, which is why the Democrats um, actually have the House. That's why the Democrats have the House, because they were able to win. Okay, 
They were able to win just enough seats. Just enough seats to hold the majority. They have 219 seats right now. 218 for a majority, but there are six vacancies. Or I'm sorry, there's uh, five vacancies. So that's why the Dems hold the majority by a seat or two right now. Because that old gerrymander just doesn't work, it at work anymore. Right? Just barely doesn't work anymore. So what are Republicans going to do? They're going to draw new maps. Now, these are old. This is based on the old. Uh, uh, this, we've talked about this before. But this is based on the old. The old. For example, this was the old gerrymandered map for Pennsylvania. Do you see this shit? The old gerrymandered map for Pennsylvania. This got thrown out by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So the Democrats picked up four seats from the new map. Same people, same voters, Rep Democrats picked up four seats. Let me show you. I want to show you the map that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court drew, right? Um, so this is the new map the Pennsylvania Supreme Court drew, right? This was the old map. Do you see the difference? Do you see how fine the Republicans gerrymandered this shit? Like, look at the 13th district. You can actually see them reaching into block by block there in the collar counties to pack as many Democrats in, right? Well, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court drew a new map. And just from this, changing from this map to this map, Democrats won the 17th district. Democrats won the uh, 4th, 6th, 5th, 3rd, 2nd, 7th, and 8th districts. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It was 9, 9. 9-9. Nine, nine. Whereas before that, it was 13-5. Uh, so the Democrats picked up four seats in Pennsylvania alone from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court drawing a new map. Right? But here's the thing, chat. If they gerrymandered Pennsylvania again, that's what it looks like. Five safe Democratic seats and 13 safe Republican seats. Just by drawing the map, the Republicans gain four seats in Pennsylvania alone. Not changing a single vote for Congress. Just by drawing the map, they make themselves four more safe seats. And you do that state after state after state after state. Look at look Ohio. Look at Ohio. 14-2. Right now, the Dems have four seats because it's gerrymandered right now. Look at this shit. Look at this seat. Look at this seat. 98.4% chance of being represented by a Democrat. So they can create one, two, three, four, five safe Republican seats. They'll make it even worse. They'll make it even worse. Look at this seat. Look at that seat. Look, look what they're going to draw. Bam. And you do that state after state after state. They could take the new data and they could draw new maps. They could draw new maps. Bam. That's another seat down. They have Georgia in the bag. They've got Arizona in the bag. Current boundaries. Bam. And do it state after state after state after state. It doesn't matter if the Democrats outperform by 10, 15 points. 20, here, here's an example. This is from Wisconsin. 2020 election again shows lopsided Republican legislative maps. Continuing a decade-long trend in Wisconsin due in part to GOP-drawn legislative maps, Democratic candidates on Tuesday secured fewer legislative seats than their statewide voter, voter total would suggest. Let me show you this, chat. In 2018... The Democrats won 58, 53% of the statewide vote for the legislature. And they got 36% of the seats. The Republicans got 47% of the vote and they got 63% of the seats. I don't care how, what, you think the Democrats are going to do better than five point wins nationally? They're going to, what, they're going to do 15 points, 20 point wins? They still wouldn't get it. 
Since Republicans redrew legislative maps in 2011, Democrats have been relegated to a minority of legislative seats, even when winning a majority of statewide votes. 2012, that was the first time right after the Republicans gerrymandered after 2010. Where Democrats got 51% of the vote. They got 39% of the seats. And here's the thing. We can't even guarantee the Democrats are going to win the popular vote. It, so you come in here and tell me, well... Let's just win. Let's just win more in 2022. I'm saying, what are you talking about, man? They're rigging it. They're voter suppressing. They are gerrymandering. I'm sorry. The Democrats just aren't popular enough to beat that. They've got their propaganda. They've got Facebook. They've got Fox News. They've got OAN. They have got Breitbart. They have got talk radio. They have the shit pumped into your fucking brain you are deluded that's why we have to do the for the people act of hr1 because that's it that's the ball game and that's not me saying that that's richard blumenthal centrist democrat from connecticut you can think I, it's not just a fringe lefty opinion that's the opinion of any democrat who wants to win it's not, this is not a what if. This is not Mike being pessimistic. This is the facts. Anybody saying, well, we just have to go around Joe Manchin is telling you that the Democrats are defeated. And it lasts for 10 years. And I don't know about you, but I don't have 10 years. Do you have 10 years? Does the planet have 10 years? Are the Dems gerrymandering anywhere? Maryland, uh... Democrats can gerrymander in uh, Illinois, maybe Virginia, although I don't, I think Virginia has a, uh, I think Virginia has some sort of uh, nonpartisan thing, don't they? Now? Yeah, yeah. See, Virginia has a nonpartisan commission, a commission divided evenly between politicians and non-politicians. So the Dems can't even gerrymander Virginia. I think they can gerrymander New York. Oh, wait, never mind. A nonpartisan commission drafts maps. So maybe the de Democrats could do something in New York. So I think they got Illinois. Oh, they can't do Maryland because Hogan, right? Subject to veto, yeah. They can't even do Maryland because Hogan's going to try to to veto that. The Republicans are probably going to pick up a seat in Maryland. Uh, California has a nonpartisan commission. I mean, maybe... Colorado has a non-politician commission. Looks like Illinois. And maybe Oregon? Meanwhile, the Republicans are going to gerrymander Texas, Florida, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Montana, uh, Arizona, South Carolina, Georgia, you know, Alabama, obviously, Mississippi, you know, Tennessee, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Nebraska, because they have a couple seats uh missouri it's a disaster there's no there's no balance there's no balance do the democrats ever gerrymander to be blatantly biased for the left not really usually they gerrymander to give advantage to the machine politicians these states are already gerrymandered are they drawing new more powerful lines yes yes because in a lot of states some of the gerrymander has started to fail the democrats have flipped some of the suburban districts that were that made sense in 2010 you know, when Mitt Romney was running in 2012, you had a slightly different electoral map than you do now. Now that there's been a shift in college-educated voters, you're going to see some of the maps are going to need to be changed. Even without gerrymandering, the Senate and Electoral College are just unsustainable with a rural-urban divide. I mean, yes, that's already the other factor, is even if we had fair districts, you would still have the structural problem of the Senate. And Wyoming having as many senators as California. So not only do we have to deal with the structural problems of the Senate itself, we also have to deal with voter suppression and gerrymandering on top. What do you think is the GOP machine endgame to make themselves have perpetual power and suppress democracy for the service of the oligarchs? What can people in those deep red gerrymandered states do? You can yell at Joe Manchin to pass a bill that is extremely popular. You can yell at, I mean, here it is, chat. Here is the coal miners union. Here's the coal miners union. Look, 
United Mine Workers of America reiterates support for the For the People Act. The United Mine Workers of America today reiterated its support for Senate Bill 1, the For the People Act, and renewed its call for passage in the United States Senate. State legislatures all over the country are revising election laws to restrict access to voting, especially among minorities, workers, and senior citizens, says United Mine Workers International President, President Cecil E. Roberts. Instead of opening up the voting process and including more citizens, those states are taking us back to the days when millions were essentially disenfranchised because of who they were and where they lived. SB1 will prevent that from happening. Further, the states that are passing these laws are making it possible for state legislatures to overturn election results they do not like, even if local election boards have certified them. These states are putting a highly partisan stamp on this issue and showing no interest in bipartisanship. Roberts noted that while the union also supports the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, passage of that legislation by itself will not address many of the ballot access issues that are becoming law in an increasing number of states. It is wrong for those states to attack the basic rights of citizens to participate in our democracy, Roberts said. Congress should be doing everything possible to not just maintain, but expand voting access and create freer and fairer elections. If only one party is interested in doing it, then so be it. And it goes on and on and on just like that. Here, let me show you, chat. Let me show you. The libs on MSNBC say something that's true. It's rare, but it happens. Of Democratic Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, um, he's the only Democrat in the Senate who has not signed on to sponsor the voting rights bill and who this weekend said he doesn't support it. Um, he made that as clear as he ever has in an op-ed that he published this weekend in a West Virginia paper. And it's, it's interesting, Senator Manchin is not actually making any substantive case at all against the voting rights bill. It's not like he's laying out the things in the bill that he's against. He says he's against it purely and only because there aren't Republicans who will vote for it. I mean, Republicans wouldn't vote for COVID relief either, and he supported that. But apparently on voting rights, Republicans saying no, regardless of why they're saying no, that's reason enough for him to say no too. Here's something else, though, that I, that I don't think you've seen. It's something Senator Manchin probably very much should see. Um, this is new polling that was just done for a group trying to pass the For the People Act, a group called End Citizens United. They work specifically on trying to get anonymous dark money out of politics. Um, they polled West Virginia voters. The margin of error is plus or minus four points here. And look what they found. This is Joe, Man Joe Manchin's constituents. Um, on the COVID relief bill, which Joe Manchin voted for, that bill is wildly popular among West Virginia voters. COVID relief has 64% support in West Virginia. That's huge. Um, then they polled on Biden's infrastructure bill, the American Jobs Act. Incidentally, that's another bill that Manchin says he won't vote for unless Republicans vote for it too, regardless of why they're voting no. Um, the infrastructure bill is even more popular among West Virginia voters, right? COVID relief has that huge number in support, 64% support. The infrastructure bill is even higher. In West Virginia, that has 68% support for the infrastructure bill, the jobs bill. But now look at this. The third piece of legislation they Maybe pulled on in West Virginia out. is the For the People Act, the voting rights bill. It is more popular than COVID relief. It is more popular than the infrastructure bill. They had 64 and 68% support for those two things. The voting rights, back, voting rights bill has 79% support among West Virginia voters, 79%. Support among Democrats, 81%. Support among independents, 79%. Support among Republicans in West Virginia, 76%. More than three in four West Virginia Republicans support the voting rights bill, the For the People Act. More than three in four Republicans. The senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, says he's against it. By a 21-point margin, West Virginia voters say they would be more likely to support Joe Manchin if he supports the voting rights bill. But he says he's against it. Every component of the bill, everything from making voter registration easier to stopping partisan gerrymandering to limiting the amount of anonymous donations from special interests and corporations, all of it is very popular. All of it has way over majority support among West Virginia voters. But Joe Manchin says he won't vote for it because Republican senators won't vote for it, no matter why, no matter what their reasons for that are. 
He also says he won't change the filibuster rules so that Democrats can pass that bill and others with a majority vote, even though the minority party, the Republicans, oppose it. The West Virginia poll also shows that Joe Manchin is against the tide of his own constituents, his own voters on that. A majority of West Virginia voters say the filibuster should be eliminated or changed, or they don't care either way. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Joe Manchin says that he won't vote to change it at all. When you look at numbers like this, and it doesn't immediately fly through the Democratic Party, you realize how the name is a fucking farce. Democratic Party is a farce. It's a joke. It's a fraud. There is not one substantive argument against this bill, and it's highly popular in his own state. And it would help him politically win again. So if it's right on the merits, it's politically popular, and it would actually make his reelection more likely, how could he possibly be against it? And the answer to that chat is very, 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 very simple. Because he's corrupt. He is being bribed. Whether it is the promise of power in the future and wealth in the form of lobbying money, whether it is literal duffel bags full of cash, whether it is campaign contributions and dark money support, or all of the above, that is what has his attention. And here's the thing about the For the People Act. It doesn't hurt the rich other than forcing them to disclose their donations to political action committees and dark money packs. That's the only thing. But it doesn't actually tax them. It doesn't actually change their power. It just makes our voting system better. It just makes our voting system fairer. But the oligarchs, they know that if our voting system was fairer, if their funding was exposed... If grassroots candidates got support from public campaign financing, if voters were not suppressed, well, suddenly that might change. That might cause political change. That might affect them. They're looking five chess moves ahead and saying, we've got to block the For the People Act because if they pass that, progressives are going to start winning more elections. And before I know it, my capital gains tax is going up. There might be Medicare for all. There might be a wealth tax. So the best thing I can do is make sure as few people vote as possible. We do politics here every morning starting at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific. You can watch us here on Twitch. We're the morning guy, the morning politics guy, politics frogs in every single day, same time, 10 a.m., day in, day out. And we carry you through your morning and early afternoon politics needs. And if you need more, Mike from PA, we have a YouTube channel. We talked about suburbs, the My Pillow guy, Ted Cruz. We talked about DSA. Amazing. Making fun of Tim Pool. Amazing. Look at all of these amazing videos. Get in there, watch them. We have me on Twitter. You got to follow me on Twitter, chat. I'm at 20,614 subs. That means I got like 40 followers on Twitter in the last day. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Go follow us on Twitter. And of course, join the Discord, where we have an incredible community of left-wing streamers. We have left-wing community. We talk about the stream. We talk about politics. There's gaming content. It's a really awesome, supportive place. Direct action, mutual aid. And you can just let off some steam. And also, you can help produce the show. One of the things I do is I look at the links that are put into the news content suggest suggestions chat room on the Discord. Join the Discord, come hang out, and uh, maybe what you want me to talk about will be part of the next show. <laughs>